Top three leadership and business lessons you've experienced, good or bad? I think it's about patience is the first one, is you know, don't rush into things, don't rush into situations. And if you don't know, take the time to assimilate the data. Welcome to The Autobiography, a video series that shines a spotlight on inspiring leaders. It captures their fascinating stories about their personal journeys and more importantly, key leadership lessons that uncovers the secrets to their success. Today, I'm privileged to be joined by Neil Hill, president of Ford Motor Group Africa. Neil has a 30-year career with Ford and was appointed Ford Motor Company of Southern Africa, MD, in July 2018. In 2021, his responsibilities expanded from the South African operations to include Sub-Saharan Africa, as well as North Africa, which has its regional headquarters based in Morocco. That was a big mouthful. Welcome, <laughs> Neil. <laughs> Thank you, George. Great to be here. It's absolute treat and privilege to have you here. And, and getting right into it with you, um, to get to know Neil Hill, the, the person, as well as a little bit more about Ford Motor Company. And uh, mm -hmm. you know, we've got to touch on EVs, I suppose. Uh, as an icebreaker question, you know, you've been very successful at your career at Ford, but there's very little that I know about the man Neil Hill. Mm -hmm. So uh, who is Neil Hill outside of the Ford Motor Company? George, first of all, great to be here. Um, myself, outside of work, one of the things that I work very hard at is actually trying to keep work and private life separate. Um, purely because you've got to have time away from work, you've got to be able to disengage and elements like that. So. How I spend my time away from work is I'm a passionate, avid golfer. Um, so I have an addiction to the game of golf. I've uh, been playing the game for over 30 years, still trying to get better at it. And then also I do, I'm an avid bird watcher. So a hobby that my wife and I do together, we picked it up from um, her parents. And that combines my other passion, which is wildlife photography. Oh, wow. So I tend to find that when I'm not on the golf course, I will be in you know, South Africa's great outdoors, um, in the bush, in the national parks, combining my love for bird watching and photography. And um, that really just gives me an opportunity just to really kick away from work and switch the mind off and do something completely different. I suppose, I mean, it, it sounds like the, the, the relaxing part of golf, because golf is relaxing, unless you stress yourself out. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and outdoors with birds, and uh, you know, that must be quite uh, um, serene and, uh, and surreal. I find it very, very calming, very therapeutic, mm. and just the ability to be able to, or the opportunity to really enjoy the environment that we have in South Africa. Mm. And that was an appreciation I developed from the time that we spent living overseas and you get to really realize what South Africa has to offer and how fantastic our weather is. Um, people talk about South Africa and all of its challenges, but we have the most incredible climate, the most incredible weather and the ability to spend time outdoors and really enjoy it. So, so it's true. really tapping into that. Lovely, lovely. What was your first car? My first car was an Escort 1600 Sport Mark II. A Ford. Two. A Ford. Escort 1600 Mark II. Yes. I remember that. Um, was that the one that was one of the first hatchbacks? It wasn't the hatchback, wasn't so it was hatch. actually the two-door. It was a sort of a special edition that, they, that, we, that Ford did in South Africa. It was built in, and I forgot my dates right, it was 79 through to 82. And it was actually the precursor for the RS2000. Oh, wow. And um, growing up as a young kid, teenager, that was sort of the iconic car that I really aspired to. And when I got my driver's license, when I was eligible to drive, I uh, was very fortunate enough to um, acquire one of those. My parents acquired it for me, and that was my first car. What color was it? It was Powder blue. Powder blue. That was a very popular color at the time. Very, very popular. Very popular color. Yeah. I was thinking of the XR3. Yes. Think, yes, the XR3 came after that. Yes, yep. I was thinking of the XR3 um, because that was one of my dream cars that I never owned. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what, is your, what are you driving now? So currently my daily driver is a, is a Ranger Raptor, uh -huh. um, which I just absolutely love. Okay. It's, it's one of those vehicles, it's a truck that you drive, you don't care about potholes, you don't care about speed bumps, you don't care about traffic circles because it's just capable of doing everything um, and it has awesome road presence um, and tends to find that taxis don't mess with you as well. 
<laughs> yes, because you're bigger. <laughs> but just in terms of the comfort, um, you know, just it's such a practical, versatile vehicle for, you know, especially when I do get time yes. away from work, either golfing or bird watching. Well, all of your outdoorsy and stuff, I suppose. Yeah, kind of just fits. fits my lifestyle yeah. perfectly and, yeah. uh, you know, get a lot of enjoyment driving it. Ranger Raptor is an impressive car and, uh, um, you know, one of the most popular cars in Autotrader, as a matter of fact. So Fantastic. Uh, Always love yeah. to hear that. <laughs> it is, it, it really is. Um, so where did you grow up? I grew up in Durban, so that was where I did major all my schooling and university education. Um, the early years of my life, the very early years, we actually spent quite a bit of time moving around with my parents. So my dad worked for Nedbank, um, and as a bank employee, he got transferred uh, quite extensively. So born in East London, when I was three months old, we moved to Durban. Um, at the age of about one and a half, we ended up moving to um, Kimberley, of all places, and spent about three years in Kimberley, oh, wow. um, and then ultimately ended up coming back to Durban, and then uh, we settled and spent a lot of time, you know, we spent the rest of my childhood years um, and early, early adulthood in, in Durban. And, uh, uh, and when did you end up in Joburg? So I ended up actually when I joined Ford Motor Company in 1991. Okay. Um, so, you know, finished university, after school, did my year's national service uh, through conscription and then got a job with Ford Motor Company and took the big relocation from, Jeha for, from Durban to initially Pretoria and then I decided that Pretoria was not quite for me. Being a Durbanite, Pretoria, Durban, mm, so I ended up settling in Johannesburg and you know, we now live in Centurion, so sort of halfway in between. Halfway in between, oh, okay. <coughs> well, um, I mean, Durban to Joburg, uh, Cape Town to Joburg, I don't know why people do it. I suppose it's really economics at the end of the day. You know, it's the, 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 the work is mostly up here because uh, most people want to be at the coast, really. Correct. And I think growing up there, you know, I've enjoyed the coast, yeah. but I really, as a, you know, growing up in Durban, I really embraced it uh, wholeheartedly. Um, so now if you ask me where I go on holiday, I'll probably t I'll go to the bush rather than going to the beach. Oh, really? Um, but, you know, still enjoy the coast, but it was really the move, re the move was because of work. Yes. Um, so it was a job offer that came onto the table. It was um, something that I, actually quite ironic, um, passionate about the motor, the, the motor industry, loved cars, always had an interest in it, um, and ended up getting a job offer for a motor company. And that sort of kick-started the career. Well, that, that leads me to my next question, which was, um, what was your dream when you were young? Um, you know, what, what, what did you want to become? It's actually quite interesting, because going, coming out of you know, later years of high school, gearing up to go to university, I had this aspiration to become a lawyer. And, um, I would never have said that. Yeah, and um, got into first year university and then decided that stats was way too hard, Latin was way too complicated, and um, then decided that after first year it was time to do a career change and a sort of a shift. Um, wasn't a hundred percent sure what exactly I was going to do or where I wanted to go, um, but ended up changing faculty. So I went into bachelor of social science at uh, Natal University, and that allowed me to pick up psychology and industrial psychology as um, two majors. And I think. What really awoke with me in that change was the interest in people okay. and working with people and understanding how people tick um, and how to work with different people. So that was kind of how I got, so I got into those as, as, as majors. I still carried on with my legal studies. Um, so I finished that. I did Which is probably years. useful. It, it's actually turned out to be very useful in the latter years. So now I can have a conversation with our company lawyers yeah. and actually know what I'm talking about and also know when they are saying things that I don't necessarily agree with. Um, but then did business administration, picked up marketing as well, and that kind of was a, it was quite a broad degree. Um, but I always say university for me was about learning to think, learning to th think differently um, and mostly adopt a, an acquiring mindset. Um, about things. I've always said that. I've always said that um, you know, it doesn't matter what you study, uh, it can be anything. Mm -hmm. what, what education does, or formal education does, is it changes the way your brain thinks. Yep. 
changes the way you problem solve. So, 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 so what you're saying is that's the biggest benefit out of out of what you you did. Yeah, it's certainly you know not being an applied science per se um, in terms of the, the degree that yes. I did, but it was really about the thought processes of the inquiring mind, you know, tackling things in a different way and you know looking at things in a totally different perspective, which I found, you know, really interesting and and yeah, I've something that I've really worked on and continued to enjoy as my career has developed. And, uh, and I mean, that goes without saying, given your, um, given your colorful rise to you know, the president's position that you occupy right now. So let's fast forward to your 20s, 30s, 40s. Um, and uh, you're a little bit older, you're more mature. Um, how has your thinking evolved? Um, what's different to when you were in your 20s and 30s? <coughs> my 20s and 30s, it was really about, you know, and, and growing up, my parents always, my, my dad especially said, you know, work hard, put in the effort, the rewards will come as a consequence of that. And, you know, come back to my enjoyment, my interest in the motor industry, now all of a sudden working inside an auto industry, the appetite and the desire to understand how things work, why they work, what happens, things like that, that was something that really just moved me forward. So you would find me, you know, went into a role as a district sales manager fairly early on, so I was working with my dealers, wanted to understand how cars are made. So you'd find me walking on the shop floor, looking, trying to find a customer's car that was in the plant, yeah, in the manufacturing plant that we needed to get out, and I'd go and find it, work with the people on the line and say, okay, find this one needs to be fixed, let's get it done. But it was very much about being focused on serving and helping dealers and helping people, but getting things done. And, you know, always got to the point where if some, somebody said to me, one of my early dealers that I worked with, he said to me, he said, you know, if you don't know, tell me you don't know. Go and find out and come back to me. And, you know, also do what you say you're going to do. And that's really what drove me in the early years. And, you know, looked, I was hungry. I looked for opportunities, chased things down. Um, and then into my 30s, I started looking at opportunities and started moving up into, the, into different positions where now you're in a management position. You, you're responsible for more people, more things. And was really thinking about how people, how I wanted to be treated by people and therefore apply that to the people that I'm working around with. Always be respectful, you know, don't ask people to do things that you're not prepared to do yourself. And that's something that I still live by today. You know, irrespective of title, you still need to be prepared to roll up your sleeves, do things that you're prepared to do and then only be in a position that you say, okay, fine. I feel comfortable asking people to do that as well. So some, uh, some people say that something happens to you when you cross the cusp of 40. Did something happen to you? Um, I don't know if it necessarily something specific, but I think what was an interesting time period in my life, because at that stage, we, my wife and I had moved to Thailand. So we'd, we were two years into a, what we thought was initially a three-year adventure living in Thailand, and we're going to come back to South Africa. Um, so I turned 40 when we were living in Thailand and that was an interesting experience because you have friends and colleagues around you but you don't have your family around you. So it was, it was an enjoyable celebration and an enjoyable milestone but at the same time somewhat um, lonely. But you know my wife and I really embraced our time in Thailand you know wholeheartedly and I think we just got that perspective of we were meant to be where we were and we made the most of every opportunity that was in front of us. So I think that there was a, a level of kind of inner peace that was, you know, we're at the right place at the right time for the right reasons. And we're on this journey that is going to take us where we're meant to be. Almost like an acceptance. Yes. I think that's a good way to put it. Of your, of your journey. Yeah. So if you could time travel from now back <coughs> then to when you were your, your younger self, um, what would you tell yourself? Um, be patient and listen. I always tell people that God gave you two ears and one mouth. <laughs> so so you can listen twice as much as you speak. <laughs> um, because there's so much that people can share, people share, people tell you. There's so much information and there's so many valuable lessons along the way that just by listening to somebody to understand, to engage, you gain so much more. Um, in terms of that connection with the people and I the like circumstances. That. Listen twice as much as you speak. 
Uh, I, I think I might just uh, you know use that. Um, that that's very good uh, good advice. So who are your heroes, Neil? Um, I actually thought you know it's a, it's an interesting question in terms of heroes, people that I watch, people you know people that really are game changers. I mean, I, th I think Henry Ford for me. Having read a book, there was a, a book that I picked up many years ago on Henry Ford, and it was, you know, it was a real chapter and verse. And Henry was a very eccentric person, but he was a absolute maverick when it came to disruption. And he took on an industry and completely pioneered something that people didn't know they needed. When you think about the era of inventing the horse car, and, and then yeah, yeah, horse and carriage to motor car. Yeah. Um, but then taking it to the next level and actually inventing the production line. You know, so moving it from a manual process of one being built in one place to now mass production. And I think that level of thinking and the, the, the you know, just what Henry actually is, his quotes, his, his view on life was very, very different. Um, so that he, he definitely sits there as a person who I would, you know, look at and I go, there's somebody who was fearless, was not scared to fail, was willing to try things, um, and then along the journey, I've had some I've had some amazing people that I've worked with, and you know, very very fortunate in South Africa that we had a lot of top leaders in Ford Motor Company that came through the organisation on their career journey that I had the opportunity to work with and, and interact with, and you know, one person in particular, Lewis Booth, stands out for me. So Lewis Booth was um, he was the CEO of South Africa. Um, and he ultimately went on to become CFO working under Alan Mullally during the global financial crisis. Oh, wow. Um, and the one thing that Lewis always taught me, integrity, honesty, um, and he never, ever forgot anybody. And, you know, it was, to me, the mark of the man was actually when he got announced as CFO, we were still in Bangkok, we were gearing up at that stage to move to China. It was a Sunday afternoon, saw the announcement come through on the email. I sent him an email congratulating him. 15 minutes later, I got an email from Lewis, which was, thank you. One of those moments when the company taps you on the shoulder, you answer the call. Yeah. And, he, and in my note to him, I said, ha ha, you know, I thought you were done with finance. And he went, yeah, you never go back, you never sway, you never sort of, deviate very far from your skill team um, ultimately and, and it was just what is incredible for me is that the note came from him yes it wasn't from anybody else he took the time it took he took the time and then you know there were a couple of other leaders that came through the the organization at the same time that have really had the opportunity to work with people observe them how they interact with others um, their humility their respect and and you know so Dave Shock is another Another individual who was also, he was CFO in South Africa, went on to become the Pacific and Africa group, so worked with Dave very closely. Um, so people like, like, you know, those those are three people that, you know, I look back at them and I go, you know, they've really inspired me. Had the opportunity of being, be working with Alan Mullally um, when I was in Australia, there was a, an opportunity where our, cross, uh, you know, our paths crossed there as well. And also just a remarkably humble man, but just a different take on things. I suppose, um, you know, when it comes to human beings, and <coughs> you mentioned it, observation, um, you know, people can say whatever they want, but <coughs> if you observe somebody for long enough, you get to the real essence of that human being. 100%. Um, you know, and, uh, and it's amazing what you can learn about people by just observing. Um, so um, let's turn to your current role as president of uh, Ford Motor Company, um, Southern Africa. North Africa. <laughs> oh, sorry, I lie. <laughs> yes, <laughs> president of Ford Motor Company, Africa. It's, um, what was the path to this role? If I go back, and 2006 is when um, I got the opportunity to go and go on international service assignment and worked, um, so I went to Thailand. And at that particular point in time, if you had have asked me would I end up where I am today, the answer would have been no. Um, purely because of the fact that it was unclear and you know, I always felt that I was not worthy of actually going into that position. Based on people like Lewis Booth, for example, who sat in the chair. You know, just had the most incredible respect and, and admiration for him. So the journey that I took was ultimately, you know, did three, three and a half years in Thailand went from a big fish in a small pond to a small fish in a very big pond. You know, left South Africa thinking I knew everything about the automotive industry, realized very quickly that 
South Africa is a very small industry. Yeah. You know, so that was a key awakening. Um, worked once again with you know, some really good leaders in the organization, um, took on board life lessons from them. You know, there were rough patches in that. You know, when you, you go and work in a foreign country and you're out of your, your comfort zone, you're working with different people um, and also working for different people from different nationalities, um, life can have some bumps in it that, you know, you, you need to go through, you need yeah. to learn. Yeah. Um, from there, did a stint in China, but New Zealand was, for me, was when I went to New Zealand and I became the managing director of our New Zealand operation, that for me was quite a key a moment of realization is that I was moving from a person who created information to a person who used information. And because I was going into a market, I knew nothing about the dealer network, I knew nothing about the product, I didn't know the legislative environment in New Zealand, but I was responsible for running a company with 68 people who were looking to me for strategic direction and, and you know, day-to-day -day <coughs> operations. So it really shifted my thinking in terms of how to tackle what I needed to do. So that was an interesting, uh, interesting thing you said. You said you went from using information creating to information, information to, to using, using information. information. Yes. Um, you know, it's an interesting way to think about it because, yep. because you had to now acquire information to use yes. rather than creating the information based on what you already knew. Yeah. Um, uh, very interesting. So, uh, so, 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 what, was this something that was planned? You know, the Thailand journey, the road to uh, uh, president, um, or was it an opportunity thing that came along as you? I went? think it was a combination of the both. So, I think you know the company certainly had a career path, or they had development plans for me that involved spending time off offshore, um, and you know ended up being ten years in total, um, working in four different countries. And I think that in itself was part of that rounding and that learning experience that happened. Um, so definitely that was part of my career development. Um, and then when I left Australia to come back to South Africa, um, my boss at the time and good friend Graham Whitman, you know, he was actually guiding me behind the scenes and he was involved in the discussions and he said, look, they wanted you to go back to South Africa, the position's not the right position for you yet, just hold fire. Keep saying no, I'll tell you when it's time to say yes. And the position then changed, so when I came back in 2016, I came in as the marketing sales and service director for Southern Africa, and I also had responsibility for Sub-Saharan Sub Africa at that stage. Um, and that was a point where now all of a sudden I had a big chunk of the business. So that was quite, it was taking all my past experience and now giving me a large section of the business to now be responsible for. And that ultimately set me up for the opportunity when the MD's job became available, that I was kind of the person who was in the right position with the right background and right experience to be able to step into the role. So taking opportunities as they presented themselves, yes. but also had a, a bit of a path, or yep. a, you know, a bit of a looking glass into where you wanted the future to go. Yeah, and, and I would say to a certain extent it was driven, it was driven to myself by a certain extent, but I think that there were also a lot of people that had the bigger plan that were helping shape where I was going and what was happening. Almost your supporters. Yes, uh, very much you know, so. To a large degree. Um, so, you know, so, so now you're in a leadership position. I mean, you've been in leadership positions in many places, but in your, in your leadership position, um, I've heard sometimes that uh, people say that leadership is a dark art. <laughs> and not a dark art is in a bad art, but a dark art in that it's difficult to succeed because of different personalities, different groups of people, different cultures um, that exist within your followers. Mm -hmm. um, does this resonate with you? And how did you develop as a leader? So 100% it resonates with me. Um, you know, you've got such a wide variety of people that you work with that are working in your leadership team, you know, leading different skill teams. Um, and also working overseas, that was something that we really had to, fo you know, I had to focus on. The, the key thing for me that I think that I learned in that journey was it's not for them to adapt to you, but rather you to adapt your leadership style for the person that you are dealing with. Almost like servant leadership type. Yes. And servant leadership is something I subscribe to. I mean, I believe organization charts are all drawn the wrong way. The so leader should be at the bottom. Because if I don't do my job, the people above me can't do their jobs. So that's something that I firmly believe in. And it's really about understanding the person that you're interacting with at that particular point in time being in the moment, focusing on that person 
but also knowing them well enough to know what their motivations are, what their triggers are, what, what inspires them, what motivates them, what turns them off, and adapting your leadership style to that person's characteristics, strengths, weaknesses, and getting the best out of them. So that's a tough thing to do because what you're describing there is um, almost being a little bit of a chameleon. Because <coughs> I do call myself a leadership chameleon. You've got to adapt your style in a room with different people, one-on-one -on -one or groups of people, depending on those personalities. Mm -hmm. Not that you're fake, but, but it's a difficult thing to do. Yeah. Um, <coughs> I always believe that there's, you know, there's certain principles that, you never, that I will never compromise on. So punctuality, you know, honesty, putting issues on the table, talking about them transparently, you know, being respectful to people. You know, so if you're in a group situation or a, a team meeting, you know, never ever disrespect the other person. And, and that's something that- Play the ball, not the person. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, work collaboratively, solve the issue together, agree, get on, do it. Um, you know, in the one-on-one -on -one situation, <coughs> certainly that's an area where I spend a lot of time actually, you know, coaching people to a certain extent, but understanding what's, you know, and I also look at it, sorry, you know, on the basis of you get the whole person that comes to work. Mm. So it's very important to understand what's going on in the person's life without being intrusive, but there are, there are family issues that will be happening. There'll be issues that will be taking place that are affecting a person. Mm. And be cognizant of that and make sure that you, you know, take that into consideration as you are asking for things to be delivered or tasks to be completed. Well, you want the whole human to show up. Yes. Um, and, uh, and we can't really separate ourselves personally and, and, and work. Mm -hmm. you, you're bringing your person to work. Correct. Um, so so I, I firmly believe in that. You, you, you've got to understand a little bit more about that whole person rather than just looking at them as a machine that's here to perform a function. Correct. Um, mm -hmm. um, so so that, that resonates with me um, a lot. So you've worked in different environments and countries. Um, and you know we all know South Africa is a diverse nation, um, different people from different places. I mean, even people from Durban versus people from <laughs> Joburg are different, and versus people from Cape Town, or maybe even people from Kimberley. Um, but you've worked in places like Thailand, China, New Zealand, Australia. What's your experience been like uh, dealing with the different cultures and languages, um, and how did you manage to adapt to these different environments? I think. Going overseas, one of the things, you know, when we ma made the move mm. overseas, I think the diversity of South Africa helped us prepare and be open-minded about what we were going to experience. You know, and, you know, you the, the individual, you the odd one out, because now you're a South African who's gone to Thailand or gone to China. It's not about them adapting to you, it's about you adapting to them. So for us, for me, it was always about you know, engage with the person, understand, you know, remember English is not their first language. They are actually compromising and speaking English to me for my benefit because I can't speak their home language in the case of Tha China and Thailand. Yes. So, you know, make the effort, you know, so I still speak a smattering of Thai, speak a smattering of Mandarin, but it's just to break the ice and to be able to acknowledge the fact that they are ultimately going to end up switching to English for my benefit um, but it's about being respectful, understanding the culture, um, and listening to people, um, and, and being in the moment and embracing it. One of the things that we did, especially in Thailand, was we didn't want to live in an area where all the expats lived. Uh -huh. So we actually, they took, I remember on the first day that we went house hunting uh, in Thailand, they took us to where all the Americans live, and we kind of looked at this and went, mm, no, this is not going to work. <laughs> Um, and then we, we directed them to literally the opposite end of the city. And it was close to where the new airport was going to open up. And there were not a lot of foreigners, or as you called in Thailand, you're called a farang. And we decided that there was a new housing estate that had been built there. And we, got, we found a lovely house in there. And we lived there for three and a half years and had an absolutely fantastic time. And we met so many different people from so many different nationalities. Um, that became our, our, our community. Um, so I think it's about the diversity of South Africa that prepped us for what we were coming in, that we, what we were going to go into. Um, so respect each everybody's differences. 
Um, I suppose, you know, from a, from a diversity point of view, South Africa is one of the countries that probably can prepare you the best for that kind of environment. Can you speak um, any of those languages? Still? I speak enough Thai to get by. Okay. Um, I can barter in the markets, I can order food. Uh -huh. um, definitely long, my favorite diff dishes. Uh -huh. <laughs> how long did it take you to, to learn? Um, probably about a year okay. before I felt really comfortable oh, really? in certain in certain settings. Um, you know, certainly I'm not going to be able to go and do conversational Thai. Mandarin is probably one of the hottest languages I've ever tried to learn. And uh, isn't Mandarin an ancient language? It's an ancient <coughs> language, but also it's got five tones. Ah. So and and don't even try understand the characters to read it. I admire people who are fluent in Mandarin can read it yeah. and can write it. Wow. I mean, it's it is. Ins Tough. insanely complex. So let's turn our focus a little bit to um, to Ford um, and talk about the um, leadership role that you took in um, getting the investment from Ford for one billion, that's billion with a B, US dollars, which is 16.2 billion rand. Well, I think it's a little bit more than that now in today's exchange <laughs> rate, but, uh, but one billion US dollars and um, um, what does this investment mean for the for the South African consumer and the South African economy specifically? <coughs> and then we can get into your new product, the Ranger. Mm -hmm. So the investment that Ford Motor Company made um, for me was just such a boost in confidence, because you know there's a lot of people who go a long way saying bad things about South Africa, and you know we certainly score a lot of own goals, um, and there's a lot of issues that we really need to overcome, but. I always believe that government's not going to solve all of our problems by themselves. Business has got to step in and business has got to be part of the solution. Our way of being part of the solution is to encourage people to bring investment to South Africa. And you know, the investment that Ford Motor Company made, you know, we'd made the decision that we were going to is build on the footprint that we had with the previous generation Ranger and that we would gear ourselves up for, for the next gen Ranger that we're in the process of launching now. There were key enablers that needed to take place and you know the decision, you know, so the company had set aside the funds. What we really needed to do was convince the government that we needed the special economic zone that was adjacent that's now adjacent to our, our facilities. Okay. And that was really where I, you know, got rolled up my sleeves and had meetings with, you know, key individuals in government in terms of convincing them how important this was. But the fact that we were actually going to deliver a potential of 2% to GDP for South Africa just from one company. Yeah. Um, and that was all of the enablers that we were working on and that we were really convincing everybody. And I think when you put a compelling story in front of government officials that is related to investment, to jobs, um, to economic activity, sustainability, um, you do get certain people's attention. And you gotta go, it is not a linear process. Mm -hmm. I will say that right up front. Um, but I think perseverance and consistency in communication and engagement is really what made it, what made the difference with myself and the team that worked on it. And did you find government receptive? Certain tiers or certain sectors within government were very receptive. Um, our previous uh, Premier of Gauteng, um, David Makura, was absolutely instrumental. Um, you know, we ha I remember having a meeting with him in 2019. He was busy on the election campaign for the ANC in the build up to the elections. And we managed to find a slot in his calendar on a Friday afternoon. We thought initially, so this, my government affairs um, director at this stage, Darren Vomali and myself went to go and have a meeting that we thought was 45 minutes. Ended up being a three hour engagement over lunch with him. Wow. Um, and he got the conversation that we were having and the severity of what we were putting in front of him. And he made a commitment and he said, you know, give me a month, we'll get together. Five weeks later, we got together and he walked up to me and the first thing he said is, Neil, I'm sorry, I'm 10 days late, but I think you're gonna like what we got to say. And that was the kickstart. Wow. And it led to November the 5th, we had a groundbreaking ceremony with President Ramaphosa to begin the construction phase of the Special Economic Zone that now has upwards of 12 factories, building parts that have been fed into our assembly operation in Silverton to build the next gen Ranger. That is absolutely incredible. And uh, you know, in the presence of greatness, I'd say. Um, <coughs> so let's turn to the Ranger. 
Um, so the Ranger is probably one of the most searched for cars on, uh, on Auto Trader, and the segment in terms of double cab gets about 15, 16 million um, searches a year on Auto Trader. Remarkable. So it's a remarkable category. Um, and you've just launched the new Ranger. So um, in that kind of quagmire of 16 million searches, a lot of vehicles in that category, how is this new Ranger different? Um, I think it's, so first and foremost, I think it builds on an established and tried and tested reputation, which is it is what we term as built for tough. It's a bucky, it's a truck that does what it says it's gonna do. But where the next gen range is really gonna stand out is it's taken, taken the segment, I think we believe that we're gonna take the segment into a new direction. Because now all of a sudden there's a level of refinement, there's a level of luxury, there's a level of creature comfort and technology in the vehicle that we've never seen before. Um, you know, just having spent the last couple of days driving our Ranger Wild Track, um, it feels like an SUV. So you've got a level of comfort and refinement in the vehicle that is, you know, not yet experienced. And then what we have also done is we've added incredible, um, yeah, powertrains to the to the portfolio as well. So we've added in a new three liter V six um, diesel engine. And that's giving customers what they were looking for, which is really about power, effortless torque, but refinement and again. efficiency and a fuel of and, and efficiency. Yeah. Um, and the key thing for us about Ranger is that it was actually built on consumer insights. So not asking customers what they liked and what they disliked, but actually spending our, our engineers, our designers, spend time in vehicles with customers, just observing. Observing. You know, seeing how they use their vehicles, what their pet peeves are, what their likes are, trying to ascertain what they, you know, what's, what is the unmet need in a vehicle. And I think that we've really gone a tremendous way in terms of moving the goalposts in the segment with a vehicle that I think is going to surprise a lot of people. I, I'm certain every time I get into it, I'm, I'm blown away at how far the vehicle has progressed. I mean, you, uh, you gave me, uh, fortunately, the um, uh, Ford Ranger to drive last year. I think it was about a year ago now. You gave me the Ford Ranger for a weekend. Yeah. Absolutely phenomenal bucky, double cab. Um, and, uh, and the one thing that uh, impressed me was it was the first bucky that I'd seen that has the technology that cars have. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so I'm pretty sure everybody else is going to have caught up to that by now, but... Bad news. <laughs> they haven't. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but it was the first time I had seen a Bucky yep. have an app, being able to start it remotely, being able to do things that traditionally are reserved for SUVs and sedans. Yeah. Well, the, the technology that is in the next-gen Ranger is just gone to a new level. Um, you know, these... So first of all, we've got a 12-inch tablet that is the center screen mounted um, in portrait for format. But what that does is it just opens up so much customizability in the vehicle. So it gives you command and control over features, over settings of the vehicle that you can set according to your personal preferences. Little things like auto hold. So when you stop at a traffic light and you, the vehicle comes to a complete stop, you don't have to sit with your foot in the brake if you choose to because the electronic park, parking brake will actually engages. hold the vehicle and engages and when you're ready to move off you touch the accelerator and it releases the parking brake and off you go. Yeah. Adaptive cruise control on our wild track goes down to zero so the vehicle actually stops. That is a the feature that I wish every other car had. The even, car, even my electric car doesn't have that. Yeah. I have to go over 20 k's an hour to engage. Yeah, so it goes yeah. down to zero. If the car in front of you then moves off, the vehicle moves off again. You know, leap of faith, test the technology, see if it works, trust our engineers, it works. Um, and then what we've done is we've taken our active park assistant, we've now made it automated parking assistance, not only for parallel parking, but for perpendicular parking. Oh, wow. And once again, okay, the technology is there, how does it work, what am I gonna crash into? It worked perfectly and oh perpendicular in a Cape Town parking garage. And it fitted it in and you, you kind of look at it and you go, I it's insane. It. And yeah. what it does is it actually backs up and moves forward and because all of the, the technology that's now come into the steering systems, the, the gear lever, we've gone to an e-shifter gear lever as opposed to a mechanical shifter. The braking is all um, autonomous. 
it all it, it does it seamlessly and all you do is you press and hold the park button and it fits it into the parking lot yeah and you get out and you're done and you're done and you know so so th what i love about the vehicle as well is that the technology that we put in there is functional useful technology it's not gimmicks yes and that's what i really appreciate about the vehicle so that's where i think people are going to be the more time you spend behind the, the the wheel of the vehicle the more time you spend driving it the more you're going to appreciate how far the vehicle a has actually moved. I can't wait for our team to review it. Um, but, uh, but that kind of gets me onto the next uh, little topic, and that is the community is a big thing for Ford, for empowerment, diversity, um, et cetera. How does the Ford leadership contribute to this in getting the ball rolling in, in these types of initiatives? Um, so we're very, very fortunate in the sense that Ford Motor Company, as our, our chairman of Ford Motor Company is Bill Ford. Mm. Um, great great grandson of Henry Ford um, and he has the most incredible um, belief in terms of and carries forward what Henry Ford always started which is you know you give back to the communities that your people that who work for you come from and you know we do a variety of different things we have a global month of caring every September all employees across the company are encouraged to go and give of their time um, helping people less fortunate could it be, yeah, it can be an orphanage that people go to and they will do, um, give of their time to paint, repair. Is this a time that would have spe been spent at work? Yes, so in lieu, of, in, in, in lieu of work desk time, we all go out into communities, projects are identified, people go off and spend a day, two days working um, and helping in these projects to be able to give back to the communities. I suppose that's probably better in many instances. I mean, money is important, mm -hmm. but uh, it, it's, it's, it's better to do that with your people than, than just the pure money on its own because it gets them to really experience what the underprivileged people that are going through a hard time are actually experiencing yes. rather than being removed and, oh, Ford is giving X amount of money. Yeah. And, and, and money is very cold. It's very clinical. Um, and... and that also comes back to our corporate social responsibility projects that we get involved with. And you know, we're really excited about a project that we've got underway at the moment. And we partner with um, various organizations. One that we, we have partnered with in the past and on this particular one is Gift of the Givers. And we've got a school project that's underway, but I'm not gonna disclose exactly what we've done there, but you know, look forward to sharing the news with you in January when we actually take the wrapper off this particular one because it is incredibly exciting. I'm looking forward to, to hearing about that. So you've recently said, uh, Neil, that customers don't differentiate between the dealer and the manufacturer. Um, when they talk about experience, they just talk about Ford. So how important is it for dealers and OEMs to keep this in mind when creating products, packages, and selling to customers? It's absolutely critical. Um, you know, we get to the point that um, we get into a finger pointing exercise, the customer loses. So at the end of the day, it's not about um, how, who solves the problem, it's about the way that we solve the problem. And I've always say to our dealers that, you know, we will get the customer sorted out first and we'll fix the paperwork after, but what we have to have is we have to have a customer who leaves with a working vehicle and a customer who's happy. And you know, globally, we've really embraced this in terms of how we look at our consumer experience and what we're doing. But you know, we learned a lot of lessons, and you and I were talking a little bit earlier about you know the Cougar experience. And you know, Cougar was a tough period of time in the company's life. But what it really taught us is what you can and what you have to do when your customers are are having a bad experience. And through honest, transparent engagement with your customers and delivering on what your commitments are customers do trust you um, and you know we learned a tremendous amount we've taken those school fees that we paid then and we've pa and we've paid it forward yeah and we've really worked very very closely with our dealers in terms of reshaping what it means to really give customers exceptional customer experience um, and it's a partnership I, we we need them to be successful they need us to be successful and each person and each party needs to play their role in terms of making sure that we understand what the customer's issue is and we then determine how we're going to fix it and how quickly we can fix it. 
That's, uh, I mean, that's amazing. I suppose it kind of links back from, um, you know, giving staff time to go um, out into the field, um, but that also extends to customers and how you treat them. Correct. And, you know, and that permeates, uh, sounds like it permeates the entire yeah. business. And I think a key thing that we're also looking at there is, you know, services on the customer's terms, not on our terms. I like that, services and on the customer's terms. And that's something that's a big mindset shift that, yeah. you know, we're really working hard at, at entrenching and making part of our day-to-day -day operations. So sticking with, uh, with um, uh, dealers and, uh, and Ford for a second, BMW and Merck have recently, in South Africa particularly, used South Africa as a test case to go direct to the consumer. Um, done by Tesla with the electric car, but I think, if I read correctly, actually, uh, um, was it Pioneer? I think it was pioneered by them. Um, I don't think anybody else has done it before yeah, I them. I think they were the first ones. I think they were the first. Um, so how does Ford think about this? Are you going in the same direction? We, we've looked at, so we have a history of actually trying different models and going back you know, into the 90s, um, there was actually an experiment that we ran in a couple of cities around the world where Ford Motor Company actually went in and bought a share of dealerships in these cities. And we formed what, you know, it was an auto collection, so it was a joint operation between the dealers as well as ourselves as manufacturer, trying to get closer to the retail um, front. I think probably ahead of their time, didn't necessarily work the best, and I think also wasn't very clearly defined in terms of roles and responsibilities. But I think we are going to see the most disruptive change happening in the auto industry in the next decade that we've ever seen. You, know, you think about electric vehicles, you think about technology that's coming in. You know, at some point in time, I think we're going to see autonomous vehicles really starting to ramp up and move forward once they clear up the, le the legalities related to who's driving, who's in control, and elements like that. But I think the, the distribution model is ultimately going to have to change. And, you know, we certainly are seeing you know, with great interest what's happening with um, BMW and Mercedes-Benz and seeing how their model applies. And, you know, we always watch and see how the market reacts to those, those elements and what can we pick up and what do we look at it. We don't have a mandate or we don't have a plan right now to say that we're going to go into that particular model. But I think one's got to be open-minded that the distribution and the sale of vehicles is going to change. And who's to say that you actually buy a vehicle going forward? Who's to say that you don't lease the body and rent the batteries. True. So I think we're in for a period of change that is really going to challenge, and I think it's gonna be interesting to see how customers react to the changing approaches, moving away from the traditional model of saying, well, I own a car, mm. versus, well, I have access to a car, I have access to transport. So I think that that in itself is just gonna drive a whole level of different thinking experimentation and, and changes that are going to change the dealer model. Uh, I, I think that's absolutely spot on. But talking about electric vehicles, seeing as, uh, seeing as you mentioned it, um, what is the future of electric vehicles for Ford? Now, let me preface that with uh, Jim Farley recently, I heard saying, he was speaking about Tesla. Um, he said that uh, Tesla um, has vertically integrated, which in fact, I believe Ford pioneered um, back in the days of Henry Ford. Mm -hmm. Um, and I also heard Jim Farley say that um, Ford wants to vertically integrate right the way back to the mines in order to bring the cost of the electric vehicle down. So is this becoming a reality? Is it a reality? Very much so. Um, so recently, you know, we, we saw announcements in the company that we'd actually taken, we'd signed offtake agreements with certain mines around the world for certain raw materials. And you know, it comes back to the, you know, we've seen certainly in recent times the race around semiconductors and making sure that you've got computer chips to be able to build cars. And that was, there were a lot of hard lessons that were learned there. So I think what the company is trying to do is it's trying to get ahead of the curve and saying, okay, these are going to be critical components, raw materials um, that are going to be required for the production and the assembly of batteries. And it's about securing access to those with mining companies and saying, okay, we want to buy your raw material and we're going to feed it into these suppliers who are going to produce batteries for us. So I think it is very definitely something that's going to happen. I think we're seeing a race for, you know, all of these components that are going to go, all these, these elements that go into making batteries. 
Um, so it's about trying to get ahead of the curve and making sure that we've got a seat at the table with the producers of that and making it happen. And I think, yeah, it goes back to Henry's days where he actually owned rubber plantations in Brazil uh, to make tyres. Yeah. Um, sticking with electric vehicles, the Mahi, and you know I'm a big electric vehicle <coughs> nut. Um, it's not been in reached in South Africa yet. What is Ford thinking about when it comes to the Mahi and South Africa? You used the key word there yet. Aha, uh -huh. okay. So, <laughs> you know, we have aspirations and we have plans to get into, you know, to be a player in the battery electrics um, space of vehicles. Um, I will be circumspect in terms of telling you when, mm -hmm. but um, certainly we have very clear plans um, in terms of what our ambitions are in terms of being a player in the battery electric space um, and with you know, a variety of different vehicles that will make up the portfolio. I suppose it would be surprising for, from any OEM if, uh, if the answer to battery electric was no, we're not going there. Yeah. Uh, you know, that would be a very surprising answer. So, uh, so, so you know, that's exciting to hear. Mm. Um, definitely look forward to, you know, one day driving that Mach E and, uh, you know, experiencing it. So let's flip back to um, Neil Hill. What is the typical day in the life of, of Neil? My day starts somewhere between 7.30 and 8 every day and I probably finish at about 6 at night. And one of the things that I'm very, um, I, I, I learned a hard lesson when I was working in China is that you've got to have an end point at your day. Yeah. Um, so very clear in terms of when my day finishes, shut down my laptop, leave my work iPad and phone to one side um, and really just have an opportunity to disengage the, the brain from, you know, from, that, you know, from my work environment. Um, and be able to, you know, relax and, and kind of just recuperate and be ready for the next day. So, if that, I mean, if that's your evening routine, what is your morning routine? Like, do you have a, a set kind of way in which you begin engaging with the day? Uh, do you have a, a ritual? Is that a lot of people, I mean, I have a ritual. I, I wake up at 5 a.m. and I exercise. Um, and then, um, you know, if, if I'm going to come to the office that day, I'll kind of prepare meals or pack meals for that, uh, that day and then, and then I'll come to the office. Um, so, you know, what is, your, what is your ritual in the morning? Very, very similar. I mean, ten, I, I don't normally get up at five o'clock in the morning. Um, I would tell I'm normally up by about six o'clock in the morning. And then, you know, the day starts in terms of, once again, if I'm going into the office, I'm out of the, hof out of the house by 6.30 to get to the office um, by quarter past seven. Um, you know, uh, unfortunately, we, we sadly had to put our dog down uh, oh, earlier this okay. year. But she was my walking uh, partner. So we used to get up every morning and go for a walk on the golf course in the estate that we live in. Um, so that was something that, that was also you know, my exercise, my sanity, and, and special time with our dog. I've slipped off on the exercise front. <laughs> always have ambitions and I always find that I have peaks and troughs in terms of oh, my exercise yes. routines. I think everybody does. If, if somebody says that they don't, and they're, they're a machine and that's not true. Yeah, <laughs> I do see some people who are like that, but I, and I, you know, I do admire them for their, for their absolute dedication to a routine and, and commitment. Mm, but you know, generally speaking, day starts with a good coffee. Um, that's uh -huh. a must. Can't do without that. Um, and then if I'm working from home, typically I'll sit and have breakfast whilst quickly scanning what's coming overnight you know, from various parts of the world within Ford Motor Company, I catch up on the Ford news. Ford is American, so you've got a different time zone there. So we've got time zones. So we report into okay. our offices in Thailand. Okay. So head office, our, our regional head office is based there. So. You know, they've got five hours on us, so there's normally quite a few tasks, assignment, emails that are waiting for, and it's really just a, a quick scan through those, understand what's happening in the day, and then get into the day. And then one of, the, one, of my, one of my previous supervisors or bosses that I worked for has become a very good friend. He taught me a very, very good lesson with regards to emails. You touch an email once. So read it, delete it, action it, file it, that, and that's something that I really work very hard at, is just making sure that I don't lose the email battle. Um, because if you get behind... You're stuck in the admin. Yeah. Exactly. So how do you think about uh, management versus leadership? Um, how do you manage people versus how do you lead people? Um, I really look at it on the basis of that I'm in a leadership role. Um, management to me is something that you sit and dictate and you direct and you steer people. Um, and you tell them what to do. Um, so that's not, that's not my style. Um, I really encourage people to take ownership um, and I always try to give them direction via asking questions, probing, 
steering as opposed to becoming very directive. If I do need to become directive, I try to do so gently but, but clearly. Firmly, yeah. um, but it's really about helping people realize where we want to go and guide them to that. So I always believe also that if people arrive at that conclusion themselves, they take ownership of it. Um, but you know, there are times when you do have to draw a line and say, okay, fine, this is what I want done. Um, but that tends to be not my preferred style of doing it. I prefer to try and lead by getting people to realize where we need to go, question, questioning, probing, engaging. I like that, uh, that term, um, getting people to realize where we need to go, because you probably know where the business needs to go, um, but the light bulb has to go on in the entire business yep. in order for uh, it to go in that direction, yep. and it's not a case of you telling them what that is, it's them realizing what that is, and it gives you the opportunity to change direction, I guess. It does, and you can, you also, you know, as you go along the journey, what you do is that you find, you know, it also challenges your thinking. Mm. Um, you know, so you, you get to reevaluate on a continuous basis. And, um, you know, one of my go to leadership, um, you know, sort of people that I would go, uh, I read and, and follow quite closely is Simon Sinek. Ah. And, um, you yeah, know, there's two philosophies that of his that I really subscribe to. One, the leader always eats last. So, you know, and there it's about, if, if you providing an opinion on something, don't go first, go last. Mm. Because if I say something and everybody else falls into place. Because they naturally might. Correct. Yes. Versus allowing others to give their opinions and their input first, often gives me an opportunity to evaluate what they're saying and assess it from a different perspective. Yeah, and also different generation. Um, you know, being in my 50s versus somebody in their 20s, you know, make sure that you're not out of touch with what's happening. Um, and then also um, another philosophy is of his that I do subscribe to very firmly is play the long game. Play the infinite game, uh, don't, pa don't play the finite game. Have you read that book? I've read it. Lovely book. I subscribe to that theory 100%. So, so very finally, Neil, and it's been an absolute treat having you here, what are the top three leadership and business lessons you've experienced, good or bad? Um, really good question that, George. I think it's about patience is the first one, is you know, don't rush into things, don't rush into situations. And if you don't know, take the time to assimilate the data. So you know, be patient, be, sometimes be a little bit more deliberate. Never ever forget people. People are what our business is all about and just continue to engage with them. Uh, listen, you know, invest the time in people. And then, you know, just keep, keep learning. Um, being open-minded and really just keep it as a, a learning journey that you go on because if you stop learning, your mind gets old. This has been an absolute treat. Thank you very much, Mr. Neil Hill, president of Ford Motor Company, Africa. And uh, well done. You've an absolute inspiration to many, many people. And I hope people get value out of this video. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Great to spend the time with you again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.